you who you I defer to Laura. Bye. So um, thank you all for having me here this morning. I'm Laura Colbert with Georgians for a Healthy Future. Um, and we are a health policy organization representing Georgians here across the state. Um, so this bill really um, lays out the authorization for our Georgia Department of Community Health to work with CMS, our federal government, um, to, to seek permission for a waiver program um, that would extend health insurance to adults making less than 138% of the federal poverty line. Um, and the way that that health insurance would be uh, secured is that the Department of Community Health would purchase private health insurance plans, just like those sold on the Georgia Access Marketplace, on the Governor's Marketplace. Um, and so folks would get private health insurance um, and those costs would be covered by the Department of Community Health. Um, there's an advisory group that would be set up to kind of help advise and recommend about how this waiver should be put together and implemented. Um, and there is a, a time frame established for um, ensuring that this waiver is submitted and approved um, by October 2025 of next okay, year. So this is not a full Medicaid expansion. It's similar to the Governor's Pathways Program. It would go uh, beyond the Governor's Pathways Program, so it would extend coverage to individuals up to 138% of the federal poverty line. Pathways stops at the poverty line. The advantage of doing it using private insurance, as you suggest, is that it gives a higher reimbursement rate to the medical providers. Exactly. Higher than Medicaid. Yes. So it's better than Medicaid expansion to use a waiver of some type. Um, it, it depends on what problems you're trying to solve for the state, but it can be advantageous so You're in that doing way. something similar to what the governor has done, but more aggressive. Exactly, yeah. And why shouldn't we give him a chance? Why shouldn't we give the governor a chance to see if Pathways can succeed before you uh, cut his legs out from under him? I mean, he is working hard. COVID stalled it, as Senator Lucas said, and it is not gotten the traction once, but now that we're beyond COVID, trying to get further approval, I can't remember the procedural problems, the granting of the waiver, the yanking it back, and all the politics involved in that. I am curious why it wouldn't be wise to give the Pathways program a chance. First, the CON bill that we've passed has a commission to study expansion of medical services through all types of ways insurance G give that a little time i'm just wondering I, I know we ought to have this discussion yeah but i'm not so sure that it's the time to move forward with until we uh, get some resolution on what's already in play yeah i think that's a really good question what this what peach care plus which is kind of what this bill would name this program would do is kind of secure the enrollment gains that have been made by Pathways, and it also builds on the success of the Georgia Access Marketplace. So again, kind of both of the governor's key health policies. So that has had some success, the Georgia Access? Yes, it's had program. incredible success. Um, okay. Real enrollment growth over the last couple of years, um, and uh, that's been very exciting to see. Um, so what this would do is help to draw down some very lucrative federal incentives for the state that go beyond what Pathways um, is able to do. So regardless of how many folks enroll in the Pathways program, it will always be costlier per person than a program like Peach Care Plus because it, it pulls down those um, federal incentives. So we would, Georgia would earn that 90% match. Feder the federal government would pay 90% of the costs, whereas Georgia would pay 10. And we would also earn a two-year sign-on bonus that, as Senator Luke Lucas referenced, is estimated by the state auditor to be $1.2 billion over the first two years of the program. Okay. Questions of uh, committee members? Senator Summers, you're recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Could you please walk me through how, how maybe the question should be this right here. The indigent care that we're dealing with in, in Georgia is is massive. Does this does this take care of that? Can you can you touch on that? 
Yes, yeah, so this program would cover, um, again, kind of based on the state auditor's estimates, somewhere between half a million and a million Georgians over the first three years of the program. Georgia has the third highest uninsured rate in the country, and so this would uh, go a long way in reducing that uninsured rate, making sure providers get paid when those folks seek care, and it really allows those folks who are currently un uninsured to take control of their health care, to manage their health care, and make informed choices about getting preventive services, picking up their prescriptions, um, rather than going to an emergency room, which is kind of their only choice at the moment. May I follow up, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Follow up. Would, if, I, I like that. But are we incentivizing people just to continue to use the system to be indigent care and go to the hospital at 5 o'clock or 5.01 when the doctor's office is closed? Um, so I think by giving people health coverage, you give them more options, right? So most people don't want to go to the emergency room at 2 or 5 o'clock in the morning. They want to go to see a physician that they know and have a relationship with. And so by giving them insurance, you give them that option to do that. When they start getting that tickle in their throat, they go to the doctor first instead of waiting until they have a 100-degree fever and they're at the hospital. So we believe that um, providing folks with coverage through this program um, really alleviates that that indigent, indigent care problem. Certainly, it won't um, you know take our uninsured rate down to zero, but it would it would be a, a a massive reduction in how many uninsured Georgians we have. Okay. Sure. Other questions from committee members, Senator Brass. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I just wanted to kind of clarify on a conversation I was having with a um, an unnamed sen senator. Um, <laughs> whose name may rhyme with, rhyme with, uh, sitting here at the table. Mucus. Um, <laughs> that conversation was, <clears throat> there was, there was a couple of things I was interested in, um, and, and reasons why I was open to, to looking at this when in the past I've been against. Um, so some of those are, you know, we do continue to see our our rates rise throughout the state for, for the insured. And then when the insured go into the hospitals and the emergency rooms are, are stacked up for, for, and a lot of that's for reasons that was just discussed. People are, are going there um, because they can't be turned away. And so, it's not just a problem for for uninsured but it's it's also we're, we're having problems for the insured and and i do think the pathways um i think that program uh has opportunity to work and i do think um i do think it it, it can work but we're only talking about up to 100 percent of the poverty level which i think is what about fifteen thousand dollars a year um, and when we take it to 138, um, you know, I don't know what that number is, but I, if I remember in the past, it was maybe around the $22,000, $24,000 a year. Um, what is it, Madam Leader? You may know better. I think it's about, it's about 31. Okay, so 30, $31,000 a year, which after the massive inflation we've had over the last several years, that's just um, that's unlivable. And as a small business owner who can't afford insurance for, for, for my employees, um, and these, these, my guys are hard workers, and there's not always 80 hours in a month for them to work. And, but they are making more than 15000 but they may not be making 31000 and I pay them well, but on an hourly basis. And sometimes, sometimes roofs leak. Sometimes they don't. And so sometimes they're not going to qualify for pathways. And they're they're certainly not going to qualify based on 100 percent. But they would on 138. And I do want my guys insured. I do want them to be able to go to um, pre get preventative care. Um, so that's what kind of got me open, finally open to this idea. And. Uh, this unnamed senator that rhymes with mucus, um, one a couple things I discussed that I'd like to see in it. It wasn't just the work requirement piece, but there was also a trigger. I wanted a trigger if the federal government ever came in and said we're we're going to do less than ninety percent. 
um, then the state could could back out and I do see that trigger I believe in line 62 through 64 um, so I'm glad to see that um, as we did discuss the work for the work requirement um, caused issues I know the Arkansas plan from my understanding is every time they they applied for the waiver on the workforce requirement it did not work they were turned down is my understanding um, and but as we discussed North Carolina uh, the way they worded it with a workforce development type uh, fund that um, that that did work and it did it did pass muster and it was accepted by I guess CMS and so um, should this should this bill proposed bill get a, a motion in a second I, w I would be offering an amendment to um, to add in a, a workforce development fund that would kind of help alleviate some of my concerns other committee members have questions uh, dr. Ritt I refer to uh, no, no, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I'm good I'm oh. <laughs> thank you mr. chairman <clears throat> I was talking to a uh, senator initials DL <laughs> and any of y'all can answer this I have a few questions here for every dollar we spend did you say that we get nine dollars back from the federal mm -hmm. government and so that money's up there collecting interest I don't you know I don't know if it's collecting interest <laughs> in Washington DC but yes for we there's a 90% match so for every dollar Georgia would spend on this program we would draw down nine dollars from the federal <coughs> government I was thinking if you build new hospitals in underserved rural areas the people will come but without insurance that can be counterproductive if they come without insurance right yeah, that puts a strain on rural hospitals when, um, and you know, really any hospital when folks show up without insurance, um, you know, not by their choice, uh, but it it ins it uh, makes it much more difficult for rural hospitals to remain financially stable. And when you r increase their patient load that has coverage, that makes it a lot easier for them to kind of stay. How much do you think it y'all think it costs to build a new hospital? I am not an expert in that area, so I would defer to our hospital friends. Okay. Uh, I think you said that more people are, re are reluctant. If they had insurance, they would be reluctant to go to the emergency room than to a doctor. Because I remember one of my colleagues, whose initials I won't say, had to go to the emergency room in an ambulance. And it's, when they found out what the cost was, they, they caught a cab. Yeah, I mean, I think what this, um, for the folks that would gain coverage under a program like this, a surprise, uh, you know, or unexpected medical situations like that can be a big hit. Even, you know, for, for some of us, you know, we can handle an unexpected $500 or $800 medical bill, but these are folks making twenty thousand dollars a year um, and so that's a really that's a really big hit so I think you bring up a good point that um, by providing them with coverage they're really they're financially protected as well as enabled to go to a physician hopefully before an emergency happens when I was in the Air Force I managed fitness and health for the pilots navigators load masters and flight engineers and we found out how important access to health care has an effect on the mission when we call people up for the first Gulf War, a lot of the people we called up didn't have health insurance, didn't have dental, so we had to send them to a doctor to get before, or and a dentist before we could train them to go fight. You know, it's kind of hard to shoot when you straight when your teeth are hurting, but we developed a program, Tricare Healthcare, which is a part of their readiness package. And I think you can equate the same thing to Georgia. Our most precious product here is human capital. And if we're going to continue to expand and be known for business and bring companies in here, we want to have a healthy workforce where people have access to health care. Thank you. And I won't. What's your initials again? <laughs> Senator Albers, you're recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, Mr. 
may go to the bill as author. Uh, do we have a fiscal note on this bill? Around 580 million is what it would cost us from my conversations with other folks, about $580 million to start the program. That's a pretty significant number, uh, Senator. Uh, there is no question about that, but you got $1.2 billion sitting in Washington for you to draw down. Mr. Chairman, uh, isn't it usually appropriate that we'd have a fiscal note with uh, the bill in the committee? That would be the normal practice. Okay. Thank you. Senator Harbison, did you have a question? Yes. I'll, I'll get to you next. I want to take this opportunity to uh, make some observations and really um, thank a lot of people involved in this process so far from an optimistic perspective. Um, I know a lot of work went into where we are now. It may not seem as if we're making progress, but uh, I remember going around the state from the north, south, everywhere with uh, the senator with the initials DL and the senator from the 51st. I was on both of those study committee trying to uh, take a look at uh, health care and, and it's, it's, it's good side in the state of Georgia. So I just want to commend the chair and everybody involved in this and all of the moving parts that have to come together for at least Let's take a serious bite out of this apple that I think ultimately we're going to have to face uh, one one day, uh, one way or the other. So I just want to commend us for at least coming together to have a good uh, conversation with it, hopefully with some positive outcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Your uh, diplomacy and statesmanship are always appreciated and a great example to all of us. I got a question from Senator Summers. Would you address the illegal situation when it comes to the health care? How are we going to, I mean, I want this to apply to Georgians. I don't, I don't, I like anybody to come to America, but I want them to come legally. How, how, how will that be handled? Um, only legally present uh, individuals would, would qualify for coverage. Only? Say it again. Only legally present individuals would qualify for what, coverage. What qualifies them as legal, I guess? Um, I'm, I'm not an immigration uh, expert, um, and so my not a driver's license. I mean, just. I, I think it would take more than a driver's license. But, again, I would defer to an immigration expert on that. Okay. All right. Other questions from committee members? We've got a few other people to be heard. We are on a...